Hello everyone, my name is Caden Howlett. If you are new to the channel, I am a PhD student at the University of Arizona. I study geosciences. More specifically, I study tectonics. I study the creation of Earth's largest mountain belts. And we're doing the first ever Q&A today. I got so many questions uh, and it's somewhat intimidating, but I've tried to arrange them in an order that uh, makes them greater than the sum of their parts, we could say. So we're gonna talk about science, we're gonna talk about graduate school, and just some rapid fire stuff, and uh, hopefully we can get after it. So jumping right in, Ash Tori asks, what do you find are your go-to resources for learning about astronomy and general science? Going back, to, for anyone who's an original fan of Astro Daily, a lot of those ideas were stimulated or inspired by a website called sciencedaily.com. And it's an exceptional website that allows you to filter uh, kind of plain language summaries of the most cutting edge scientific research that's happening around the globe. And it's really cool to check this out with a cup of coffee. You can kind of stay dialed into uh, where different disciplines are going, ranging from molecular biology to computation, artificial intelligence, geology, anything you might be interested in. I found that that's perhaps a bit better than going straight to CNN or Fox News with your coffee. Uh, get some science on board before you look at all of that stuff. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and another thing that might be somewhat controversial is at least for just general interest, Wikipedia is a great resource. I've found it to be very helpful, particularly in the context of the history of science. There's so much amazing history. You have to obviously make sure that the references are legit and take all the normal precautions that you would with Wikipedia, but I have nothing against it. Highly recommend. My buddy Jacob Gardner asks, in a world where a plethora of influences are competing for your attention, what tips do you have for getting more out of reading or content consumption generally? This is a great question. My answer would be to organize blocks of time uh, in which there's not a chance that you will get distracted or interrupted. And whether this is a half hour or two hours or four hours, uh, I'm talking phone out of the room, preferably off. Uh, no chance that you'll have to mess with your music, have something queued up or a playlist of some kind. And that's just essential now because the gravitational pull, the magnetic uh, attraction that we have to our cellular devices is just distracting as hell. Another thing that um, I think I've learned is that and that is perhaps overlooked is that you should be very careful with the kinds of content that you interact with, uh, particularly on YouTube. And a short anecdote, I recently clicked on a video from this guy, Joey Chestnut, who is like a hot dog eating world champion. And it was some title that you like couldn't resist. It was like, I set the world record for most Big Macs eaten in a sitting. And it's like, okay, I'll, I'll see what that's all about. As soon as I interacted with that content, the next time I got on YouTube, my homepage, there was a bunch of videos that were like uh, me eating 20,000 calories in a day or like the KFC platter challenge. I'm like, so what I'm getting at is that the algorithm is going to funnel you things based on what you've interacted with. And if that is not uh, content of high quality, you are likely to be pulled into a, a wormhole, so to speak, of complete shit. <laughs> so with some more science kind of moving in, uh, what are your thoughts on the recent activity in the Ring of Fire? Is there a big tectonic movement coming or was that it? This question is from Heeman Hilton. So this was asked, I noticed, shortly after a magnitude 7.2 earthquake occurred in Peru. This is a pretty big earthquake. Um, and if you go look at a map of the Ring of Fire, which is, you know, this zone of really stimulated volcanic activity and tons of earthquakes around the, the Pacific plate margin, uh, there's earthquakes going on all the time. And so 
There may be some days where there's a little more, but you know, on the average day, there are hundreds to thousands of earthquakes occurring along this zone as a result of plate tectonics. And uh, it's very difficult to predict big events. And so, you know, if one big event pops off or maybe a couple pop off, it's, it's virtually impossible to say whether that's an indication that shit's about to hit the fan. Uh, predicting catastrophic earthquakes is important and extremely difficult, if not impossible, with our current technology. And so I don't foresee anything big coming, uh, but I could be proved wrong. <laughs> Next question is from Aislinn Reynolds. What is an unsolved mystery about the earth or within the topic of geology that you find interesting? This is a fantastic question. And there are tons that I'm interested in, but one that I think is the most important that I don't uh, specifically work on, that, it, that will be a Nobel Prize winning uh, discovery or explanation is the cause for magnetic field reversals on earth. And if you know anything about this, we have the geodynamo, which is uh, theorized that, you know, motion of liquid metal in the outer core of Earth creates the magnetic field. And recorded in the seafloor as a result of spreading at oceanic ridges, uh, we have discovered, and it's now very well known, that Earth's poles reverse through time, uh, meaning the North Pole in some in some cases is at the modern south pole and that it goes back and forth and there appears to be no cyclicity uh no no pulse that's consistent sometimes it'll last for tens of millions of years and other times it'll it'll change much quicker so that's one that i find incredibly fascinating huge outstanding question in geology next question is my opinion on the phobos monolith and the Cydonia region of Mars. So the Phobos monolith, as far as I'm concerned, this is a rock on one of the moons of Mars called Phobos. And the internet goes crazy with these kinds of things. Low resolution imagery from orbiters will find a, uh, a feature and then there are all sorts of extraterrestrial or intelligent Ex intelligent life explanations for these features. And that kind of takes us into the Cydonia region, uh, which I'll show a picture of the so-called face of Mars. In 1976, Viking 1 took some images that were pretty low resolution and people went crazy because these images uh, expose what looks like a face in this region on Mars. And yes, it is convincing. They're very large structures. Um, but they were low resolution. And people interpreted those to be the remnants of ancient civilizations that had built these things. Uh, there's another feature that is a five-sided pyramid. Some people interpreted it as. Um, and then we went back, spacecraft like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter in uh, 2006, 2007, uh, took higher resolution images. And as far as I'm concerned, these are just geologic features. Um, and there's this term I came across, pareidolia, the tendency for perception to impose a meaningful interpretation on a stimulus, usually visual, so that one sees an object pattern or meaning where there is none. <laughs> so, yeah, say no more. <laughs> Next question. Do you believe in horoscopes? And if so, why? And is there any astronomical or other explanation that scientifically backs this concept? that so many people believe in. This is from Celia. I've never gotten into horoscopes and astrology. I don't have a problem with people enjoying them if it's improving their well-being. But I will just share one quote from the Planetary Science page from Berkeley, UC Berkeley. The quote is that scientific studies involving astrology have stopped after attempting and failing to establish the valid validity of astrological ideas. So far, there are no documented cases of astrology contributing to a new scientific discovery. <laughs> but, you know, to each their own. Next question from Fonda Lijek. Do you think that humans could be outrun in evolution by some other species originating on Earth one day? I think that considering the timescales on which evolution by natural selection operates, 
this is highly unlikely. We would probably destroy any species uh, if it came close. Um, so I don't think that that's very likely. I do love considering, however, the, the thought experiment of if humans were to go extinct, which species might replace us as the next intelligent one. It would probably be a tool using species, probably like a chimp, one of our cousins. Um, but, you know, maybe something like I wrote on here, maybe a seahorse or maybe algae, something crazy could happen. Fun considerations. Rick Smith asks a very difficult question. What was here before the Big Bang? <laughs> There's this idea of the initial singularity. If you're familiar with black holes, singularity is a, is a point of infinite density in space-time where um, a certain amount of mass is compressed into an infinitely small volume. And so if this initial singularity idea is correct, the question of what was there before the Big Bang doesn't make sense because all of space-time, all of energy would have been contained in that point of infinitesimally small volume. It's pretty crazy. I like, I think more likely some of these explanations that call upon quantum mechanics, uh, the big bounce, for example, which is essentially quantum fluctuations, perhaps uh, pointing towards at the end of one universe closing, another opens. And so you can't really uh, say for sure what was there before, but that there was an existing universe prior. And then something like the multiverse, which uh, postulates that our universe isn't the only one. It may indeed be one of infinite universes. So, you know, crazy stuff. Great question. <laughs> the ulti those, those explanations, however, they leave open the ultimate question, which is what came before, right? Unanswered. The next question is, what is your favorite album? And can you give us a few examples of your favorite sounds in an instrumental? Any interstellar sounds that you'd think would mesh well with music? This is a great question from my friend Zach Schmidt. Um, I listen to almost exclusively hip hop and it was tough to narrow it down, but I think my favorite album is probably Blackout. I think 1999, Method Man and Red Man. A lot of hard instrumentals on there. But going to the second question, I generally like uh, instrumentals that have like a really hard 808, so some crazy bass, and then some some chord progression uh, or melody that is simple and, and high, like a flute or a, a simple piano progression. Um, some examples, Benching by Jay Critch. Going Broke by D. Watkins. It's Easy by G. Easy. Fire. In, in all of these instances, I think that the drum, or like the hi-hats or the claps, if they're, if they're fast enough, it would be really cool to replace those with the audio of um, pulsar radio frequencies. So pulsars are rapidly rotating neutron stars. And I'll share uh, an example of what these things sound like when they're converted to audio. But basically, they, they, they behave as a lighthouse would. They eject super energetic particles from either pole. And since they're rotating so fast, if the orientation is correct, those, those pulses hit us. And it's remarkably consistent. Replace a hi-hat with a pulsar. That would be sick. Cool. So moving into graduate school tips. I know we're going rapid fire, but I got a lot of good questions. Kind of graduate school general advice, this applies to undergrads as well in a lot of cases, specifically this first one. Would you recommend taking graduate level classes as an undergraduate as a way to look better to grad schools? I am a math physics double major from Gabriel Mack 17. Short answer, absolutely take graduate level classes. 
If you're interested, even more important than looking appealing, if you're interested in grad school, it'll give you a great um, glimpse into what it might be like if you take those grad classes. Yeah, that's kind of my basic answer there is you definitely should. The next question is any tips to help relieve the cost of being a student? I don't have like really any good advice that's not super general. You got to be careful with the way you spend your money. If you go to the bar a lot, that is, in my opinion, such a waste of money. You know, if you're dropping $50 at the bar, could be spent a lot better in theory. Get people to buy your drinks. Also, if you're getting like multiple coffees at the coffee shop, there are simple ways to cut down, right? Um, and then if you have time for a side hustle, pick up a Patreon, start creating content on YouTube. If you feel like you can do it, you might be able to pull in some uh, additional money that way. Next question, how do you pick a sub-discipline or research area to focus on in graduate school? Uh, my answer here is to explore as many different things, as, as many diverse topics as you can during high school and your undergrad. Uh, picking a sub-discipline in G something like geosciences can be difficult because there's so much. There's petrology, there's geophysics, there's economic geology, sedimentology, t uh, structural, you know, everything. Uh, so you want to expose yourself to as much as possible to see what you think is most interesting. If you're in graduate school already uh, and get lucky, kind of the overarching goals of a project will allow you to confront questions uh, that you find personally interesting is what I added there. So really the way to figure it out is to, to get your foot in the door with as many different things as you can. Next question advice for pursuing a master's or PhD in geology if you didn't study geology in undergrad. This is hard for me because I was geology all the way through. I think that any background in physical science or science in general um, or even writing would be immensely helpful in succeeding as a geoscience graduate student. And then if you don't have any of that even, just having a, a serious sense of enthusiasm and a burning curiosity for questions in natural science will will go a really long way. Blues Note 1 on YouTube asked, why did you choose Arizona for grad school versus others? The first thing I put is it's, it's an excellent school. It's ranked number two in uh, the country for geology. Um, and fortunately, the faculty here a majority of them do research that I'm immensely interested in. So that was good. <clears throat> Another reason is because it's the only school I was accepted into for my PhD of four that I applied for. So that was kind of lucky, but those are the two, the two answers there. Also from Blues Note 1, what are the pros and cons of conducting graduate level research? Pros? The contribution and creation of original knowledge, that's a big one. Uh, some of these pros might sound negative. The next one is it's incredibly challenging. Next is it exposes where you are strong and where you are weak, which is just a, a good life lesson in general. Uh, it teaches you how to manage your time seriously. Um, and if you're in the right discipline, it's just, uh, it's an absolutely beautiful pursuit because you get to spend your time thinking and writing and researching questions that you find personally fascinating. <clears throat> Cons, it, it's, it can be very stressful for sure. Imposter syndrome is something that a lot of people deal with. I think almost every PhD student at some point feels like they're too stupid to do the work that they need to do. It's kind of stressful. And then one of the horrible, one of the worst things is this feeling almost perpetual feeling that you need to be working because you really have really loose deadlines usually and so you feel like you're getting behind but you learn with time and wisdom that you can't work all the time. Tanner Johnson asks what are some career options for geosciences after undergrad including grad school options? Grad school is one option. Um, after your undergrad there are things like industry, mineral exploration, oil and gas. Also, if you want to go a different route, environmental monitoring, environmental remediation, um, and then, of course, policy. Working for the USGS, for example, uh, there are lots of places you can take it, 
internships could expose you to things that you may or may not want to do. Next is from underscore dot dev MR. What is a unique quality that makes a student stand out in the academic world applying for grad school? Previous research experience is a big one. Um, and just to get right to the point on this one, for me particularly, making connections during undergrad, networking, this also sounds very cliche, but I would absolutely not be in the position I am if I didn't, if I hadn't met the people I did during undergrad. So introduce yourself to people that terrify you because it could pay off in a big way. Next, tips to do well at college as a geography major, dot, 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 for a procrastinator from Chaud 3 nnn I have dealt with procrastination myself. If you're addressing questions that you find personally interesting, it makes it way easier to get absorbed so you're less likely to procrastinate. Figure out what is most interesting to you. Something I've emphasized in the past, working at the right time. You can't work all day. It'll feel like you're procrastinating if you sit around trying to work all the time. It's unrealistic. And then avoiding social media. It's just devastating. It, it leads to so much procrastination. Minahil Ahmad asks, how difficult is it to have a career in field geology? Also, do you ever regret choosing to pursue graduate school, which I'll address in a later question. So I think I just want to emphasize here that it can be difficult to get a job in field geology. There are not a ton of jobs that are solely field geology. It's important to emphasize the fact that well over 50% of my life as a field geologist is spent in laboratories and on computers. It's a huge component. So I'd say, yeah, it is difficult. Was there ever a time where you were worried you chose the wrong career from Jules on YouTube? Yes, is my answer. I say that most masters and PhD students in geology probably could have gotten a job in industry um, and made a lot of money, oil and gas, go work for Exxon, live in Houston. You know, you could you could easily be making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. And we choose, you know, after after five years of experience, going to grad school, getting a Ph.D., especially a Ph.D. This is a massive life decision right now for me. The, th the idea of buying a house, having a wife, having a child, those are laughable ideas. I've delayed basically my entire life for this opportunity. Um, so there, it comes with no uh, lack of question, questioning your decisions for sure. <laughs> Next, what are you hoping to do with your PhD? Uh, short answer, I want to do research and I want to teach. I want to be a professor. And it's a long road to get there, but hopefully I can make that happen. <laughs> Next, what inspired, this was a common question, what inspired you to be a geologist? Another short answer, I grew up in the mountains, I grew up in Alta, Utah in the winters, and I grew up in uh, northwest Montana in the summers, surrounded by glorious mountains, bodies of water, um, rivers, and that just, I knew I had to be outside, I knew I loved the natural world, and I figured if there was a way for me to make a living while exploring these things, it would be for me. And it turns out that it's pretty good. All right. Rapid fire questions. Thank you for sticking with me. What's your dissertation on? <laughs> Broadly speaking, it's on mountain building in the south central Andes and in west central Montana. I study the geometry, the kinematics, and the timing of the development of cordier and fold thrust belts. Uh, so that's that. Favorite book. I did fiction and nonfiction. Favorite fiction book is The Collected Fictions of Jorge Luis Borges. And my favorite nonfiction book is Wonderful Life by Stephen Jay Gould. What's your most challenging class you've ever taken? Advanced Physical Sedimentology with Peter DeSell at the University of Arizona. This class uh, goes into things like fluid dynamics. You know, we're interested in the kinds of processes within fluids that are uh, result in the transportation of sand grains, for example. We're interested in why rivers form, stuff like that. Very mathematical, very physical. If you could tell your younger self 10 years ago 
advice, what would it be? My answer here is to be yourself. Expose yourself and building off of that, expose yourself to things that are scary while being yourself. So don't lose that sense of who you are uh, and don't care that much about what people think. Clearly, I don't. I'm just out here flapping my lips on the internet. <laughs> Miranda Grover asks, why did you start wearing a bucket hat? See question above. Be yourself. This is not even, <laughs> this is not even special in any way, but I've gotten shit for wearing a bucket hat recently. Smile. Be yourself. Who cares what people think? Next question, are you single? Yes. <laughs> Next question, Coke or Pepsi? I think that's from Blue Notes 1. My answer there is don't drink soda. It's horrible for your body and your teeth and your mind. <laughs> Next, if the opportunity presented itself, would you go to Mars? Cliche answer, it depends on if there's a return ticket. I love my family so much, my mom, my dad, and my sister. So I'd be so sad to leave them forever. However, I do lean towards yes. <laughs> Sorry, everyone in my family. I would probably go, honestly. Life is too short. All right, and the final question here. What would you say is the most fundamental purpose uh, in living as a human being? And another one was, what would you say is the most fundamental point in living life? I think that my answer to this is that you need to make your own meaning. People find meaning in such uh, an array of different things. You need to explore as many ideas as possible and you need to find the things that make you feel good inside. And then, so it's not entirely selfish, I think probably the most important thing in life is to be nice to other people. Be kind and and acknowledge the overwhelming importance of love uh, in existence. And that is, I'm going to step off the soapbox on that one. An endless string of cliches, perhaps, but I really appreciate you guys listening and I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, more Q and A's in the future. And if you are a student out there, keep grinding, find things that you love to do. Uh, and if you're not a student, there's plenty of opportunity to learn things uh, and keep doing your thing. Be yourself. And uh, in the meantime, subscribe on YouTube <laughs> and like the video, drop a comment, share with your friends, go check out my Patreon, exclusive content, and it's on the up and up out here. Life is good. I love you all. Thank you for watching. Bye.